Our next speaker is John Curavilla, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at University of Toronto and a Clinical Investigator in the Division of Medical Oncology and Hematology. He's a hematologist and a member of the lymphoma program and autologous bone marrow transplant program. He's here to speak to us today about T-cell engager antibodies. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, good morning, everyone. And so uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now and, uh, and talk a little bit now on the antibody side about uh, how to potentially manipulate T cells. And in particular, this is gonna be a focus on the area where these compounds have largely been developed uh, within hematologic malignancy, specifically within lymphoproliferative disorders. Um, and by way of disclosure, I am gonna be talking a little bit about uh, a drug that has gone through development and is in phase three clinical trials now, a blinitumumab developed now uh, with Amgen. And uh, so I have received honoraria and previously have received some research funding from them. So, you know, I think a good starting point here is to look at uh, the revised uh, update of the hallmarks of cancer, where immune evasion has certainly emerged as one of the key hallmarks of cancer. And one of the questions that, come up, that comes up is how can we potentially prevent this? So you've seen some strategies about this already. Um, but one of the examples is to look at a bispecific antibody. And so these are uh, slides that were put together by um, Rob Laster, who's a PhD that I collaborate with. And so the concept here essentially is that you can build an antibody that rec recognizes the antigen of interest, presumably on your target, which you can see on the top of the, the slide there. And on the bottom, you can buy, bind another target of interest, and then you connect those two cells together with your antibody. A bite then, or a bispecific T cell engager, the antigen recognition is to bind towards the tumor cell, and again, on the other side, the, the immune effector is then recruited, and, and such then the, uh, the action is by binding to a T cell. Specifically then, when this happens, uh, you then connect the tumor cell to the T cell, and now the, the generation of uh, cytotoxins, such as perforins, that can then lead to cell death. What are the targets of choice? So CD3 is the monoclonal uh, target uh, in terms of the antibody binding to the T cell. And then against the tumor antigen, you can pick basically whatever tumor antigen of choice that you want that you can generate, thus binding any, almost any external uh, antigen in theory. So you take those two fragments, you generate a linker, and then you bind the tumor cell, you bind the T cell, creating an immune synapse and leads to the release of these cytotoxins. So that's basically the principle. One of the things that's come up, I think Mark mentioned it already, so um, one of the things in the early phase clinical trials that came up as an issue was the development of cytokine storm, felt in some part to be potentially due to the release of enhanced numbers of, or potentially through artificial creation of these immune synapses. But I'll show you some clinical data that speaks to this moving forward. So the compound that has been uh, in development for the longest in this setting was actually uh, uh, generated in Germany and is called blinitumumab. So this is an anti-CD3, anti-CD19 bispecific T-cell engager, uh, or bite. And so as you can see there, there's the structure. So CD19 is seen on all mature B cells, so it's a very relevant target for us treating B cell malignancies. And as I already mentioned, CD3 is found on T cells. So uh, in terms of this, the linker might be the other interesting piece of the technology. The antibody itself isn't glycosylated. That's able to keep things very short for steric purposes to bring these two types of cells together and then allows the T cell and the tumor cell to come into close, close proximity, which is really the whole point of what they're trying to do here. So the key features of this um, is that you can generate um, impressive target cell lysis using these T cells at sub-picomolar concentrations. Uh, this has been designed to activate T cells to kill in the presence of these target cells. There really haven't been any descriptions of autoimmunity uh, uh, up until this point. And this may also allow uh, T cells to serially kill targets as well, um, giving them time to recharge granzymes and going through again. And in preclinical models, uh, T cell energy hasn't been demonstrated, but certainly some of the early signs when looking at uh, resistance mechanisms is in part that may be the case potentially through up, uh, up regulation of the PD1, PDL1 ligand, um, ligands. You see uh, expansion of these bite activated T cells um, as long as uh, target cells are present. But just to highlight the point at the end there, the biologic half-life of the compound is short. It's only two to three hours. And this is certainly one of the issues that has 
proven somewhat difficult when taking this antibody into the clinic. So I'm not going to show you a lot of the early phase data because in ALL there are now a larger phase two and now a, a presented, though not published, a randomized phase three trial. So I will define what cytokine release syndrome is if that hasn't come up earlier in the, in the symposia today. So this is a, a syndrome characterized by the presence of potentially multiple symptoms fever, tachycardia, hypotension, capillary leak. So again, you see accumulation of fluid potentially in the lungs or all over. This can be associated with uh, respiratory distress, potentially associated with encephalopathy, uh, is seen more often in CAR T cells, at least in the early data that's been available. But uh, in some of the studies with blinitumumab in the early days, up to about 10% of the patients uh, would experience a grade three or greater toxicity of this type. And so that certainly is medically important. That is something you typically have to treat uh, aggressively. The contrasting toxicity that's also been an, an issue is, is neurologic. And what is described is a variety of things, ranging from things that we think are fairly typically easy to manage, such as headache, uh, but then other things such as tremor, aphasia, or ataxia, disorientation, and even seizure. And this, again, in the development of a therapeutic does certainly raise some concerns and limitations for as to how you deliver the drug and how you may need to monitor patients moving forward. The administration, as I mentioned earlier, is not particularly convenient. Um, when they looked at bolus infusions given over two to four hours, at least in, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and in CLL, this was not seen, uh, this was not associated with significant responses, and they saw higher rates of toxicity, which in part may, may be a peak effect in terms of uh, drug level in the blood, trials with those schedules were terminated early. And so the idea moving forward was this was going to be a continuous infusion drug, at least based on this generation of a, of a bite. So one of the clinical trials I'm going to show you now was published uh, by Max Topp, who led this trial uh, and was published last year in the Lancet Oncology. And so essentially, this was a phase two trial of blinitumumab and relapsed refractory ALL. Uh, given at, by continuous infusion at a dose of 28 micrograms per day, four weeks on, two weeks off, uh, typically two cycles, um, looking at the primary endpoint after those two cycles and allowing to continue up to three cycles uh, as consolidation. Um, this is an area where uh, transplantation, specifically allogeneic transplant, is potentially still considered curative, and thus a goal here would be able to debulk a patient, achieve a good remission, and then potentially take them off study and take them forward to a potentially curative cell cellular therapy. Uh, so the endpoint of the study uh, was looking at a complete a remission or complete remission with some hematologic parameters that are a bit different, fairly typical in a leukemia study. Secondary endpoints are all of the things we would typically want to see, time to event endpoints such as overall and relapse-free survival, what percentage of patients could go on to a transplant, certainly looking at toxicity as well. And these were studies that our leukemia group uh, was also involved with over time. So the inclusion criteria here, again, as mentioned, uh, this was in an, in an ALL uh, population who had had treatment failure defined by these uh, characteristics. The exclusion, uh, you couldn't have failed an allogeneic transplant within three months. Acute or, uh, active uh, acute or chronic graft-versus-host disease would be excluded. Typically, those patients are treated with steroids and are often sick for other reasons. And again, an important proviso, the lack of uh, relevant CNS pathology given the potential CNS toxicity associated with the drug. So looking at the patient characteristics of, uh, for hematology, a very, very large phase two study of about 190 patients. Median age is typically young because this is what you tend to see in patients with ALL. You can see the majority were uh, between 18 to 35 or 35 up to 55. Fairly heavily pretreated group. Um, but again, there were a number of patients that had only had one prior line of therapy, and I think that's because of the other earlier data that showed that this was, if not a viable, but probably one of the most important uh, treatments that was available in this setting. About a third of the patients had had uh, prior allogeneic transplants, and how can you assess disease burden very easily in a leukemia? Well, you can just count the number of blasts, and you can see uh, a proportion of patients had a fair amount. More than half of them had a 75% blast count in their bone marrow prior to a trial initiation. When you look at the response rate, so complete responses were seen in 43% of the patients. Um, when you look at those who were rendered hypoplastic or aplastic, that's another 10%. 40% did not respond to treatment. Uh, when you look at the toxicity, 
Um, looking in the patients that went on to have a transplant, so 40% of those patients, uh, of the total uh, that, that had the therapy went on to have a transplant, and the 100-day transplant-related mortality was about 10%. So for contrast, that is roughly what one would expect in the modern day for an allogeneic transplant, so no big concern of increased toxicity. Certainly we've seen other experiences with other types of antibodies where you see higher risk of things like venoocclusive disease of the liver, but thankfully that was not something that was seen here. And interestingly, when you looked at patients um, uh, looking at rates of minimal residual disease after two cycles of therapy, uh, you see some very encouraging numbers that this type of treatment is potentially quite uh, effective at eradicating disease in the blood. Here's the relapse-free survival curve. Again, um, six months, which for this type of disease I think is quite encouraging given other prior standards that were available. There's the overall survival plot as well. Uh, they looked at a landmark analysis uh, from day 77, able to segregate responders versus not. You can see, not surprisingly, the responders tend to do uh, much better in terms of their overall survival. In terms of AEs, so again, keep in mind this is a, a population that's often fairly sick in patients that have been treated for acute leukemia. Uh, when you look at a uh, worst uh, grade, you can see, unfortunately, 15% of patients experience death on the trial. So this is regardless of causality, grade three or four events in two-thirds of the patients. What stands out is, I think, largely what we see in most patients with heme malignancies in these types of studies. So a febrile neutropenia rate of about 25%, grade three, four neutropenia in about 15 to 20%. Uh, but nothing else uh, too, in, uh, too worrisome in what's noted in those other AEs. When looking at fatal events here, just to highlight, again, a pattern, infection is certainly a risk not just because of the treatment but of the disease, and so there were 17 deaths, disease progression in five patients, uh, a couple of hemorrhages, and then a couple of other less common events on the bottom there. And of the, the patients with fatal AEs, 27 of those 28 cases did not actually uh, achieve response. Looking at neurologic events, uh, certainly what you can see here is that they are a little more frequent than what we see with other drugs. And as an example, grade three or greater in 13%, looking at any grade in about half of the patients. And so you can see a smattering of things that aren't that, uh, that common. But again, it stands out that when you, maybe when you start to group things together, encephalopathy, confusional state, aphasia, neuro neurotoxicity, you probably do get a sense that this is something in this setting that you will see roughly about 10% of the time when it's, me when it's clinically meaningful. So the conclusions from this trial um, certainly confirm the idea that there is very good single-agent antileukemic activity for blinitumumab in relapsed refractory ALL. I haven't shown you the, the data broken down by subset just in the inter interest of time. Responses were seen across all relevant subgroups in this disease. Fatal AEs were only seen in people that you were unable to control the disease. Uh, and I apologize, I wasn't able to actually show you any of the slides from the study because it is embargoed, I think, again, because of presentation at ASH this year. But at the uh, European Hematologic Meeting, uh, the TOWER study, which is the randomized confirmatory phase three trial of this, uh, of this agent in this setting, was reported as positive, showing an overall survival advantage. So we are seeing practice changing uh, data coming forward in, in ALL with this agent. Now to switch gears, um, I'll show you a little bit of data about where this is going in a slightly more common disease in, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so the phase one of this was also published by the German group, and this time this year, finally, after many years in the JCO. And this was a phase one looking at a number of different dosing schedules. They wanted to look at standard phase one endpoints, including PK and PD, and to get some early uh, signs of uh, response. A traditional three plus three dose escalation study with two phases. Uh, so firstly being the dose escalation phase, and sec secondly an extension uh, when they achieve their target dose of 60 micrograms per meter squared per day, and looking at activity. So the su uh, study scheme is here. Just to highlight the point of they looked at a number of different dose levels. They tried to look at a flat dose. They looked at stepwise and ramping up dosing. Um, because I think in lymphoma, it was a little more open to try and better understand how to target the drug uh, and its dosing. 
Because I think also philosophically, a group of lymphoma doctors are much like solid tumor physicians. We're not going to be quite as willing to put up with a lot of the hassle that was associated with this in ALL because there are a lot of other active therapies that are available. And so trying to make this very user friendly moving forward was clearly the goal in lymphoma as opposed to what was seen in ALL where there weren't other options and the ALL docs are very good at looking after very sick patients. So what you can see here, so this is a smaller study, but still over 70 patients in a phase one experience. Um, this included a variety of histologies, including follicular, uh, mantle cell lymphoma, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, multiple lines of prior therapy, about a third had had prior autologous transplants. All of them had, had, had essentially had at least one course of rituximab-based therapy. Looking at the DLTs here, again, what stands out, you see um, a CNS event at dose level four, you see a metabolic acidosis following a grand mal seizure, so again, another CNS event, and then at dose level seven, CNS events. And so this seems to be the issue, uh, and they were appeared to be highest when you were getting to 90 micrograms per meter squared per day, suggesting a dose response relationship here. The MTD was established at 60, and it is important to know these, these CNS events are self-limited and will usually settle after a few days upon treatment discontinuation. When you look at uh, neurologic events in the extension phase, so this is what stands out. So um, a number of patients were ultimately discontinued if you look at, uh, at the, the column on the right there. And you can see they looked at also a couple of options in terms of trying to blunt this neurologic event, whether it was prophylaxis with corticosteroids potentially to modify the immune milieu of cytokines. And there was a, something similar to pentaspan, so a polysaccharide that was used where they'd had some uh, data in the, in the preclinical setting that this was helpful. And so they tried to look at that as well as something that mitigated toxicity. And uh, it looks like that may be something that we may see a little bit more of moving forward, but I think, again, days here are quite early. Uh, looking at the AEs, as one would expect, uh, typically seen within the first days of the infusion start and then decrease over the course of the therapy. Um, when you look at the, when you get out beyond, uh, you know, about day 50 or so, you see a 50% reduction in incidence. So again, once you get through that early period where the disease is under control, it appears easier. And, and as mentioned earlier, higher doses were more likely to be associated with DLTs. So this is probably not going to project that well to the back in terms of the table, but when you look at grade 3 or grade 4 AEs, they were fairly significant. Three grade 5 AEs were identified, okay, in this setting, uh, sepsis and, uh, and a case of pneumocystis pneumonia, one in uh, the extension phase, and then one patient ultimately died of uh, pulmonary involvement from progressive disease. But again, the toxicity here was really no different than uh, what was identified in the uh, ALL studies earlier. Looking at the neurologic events in a little more uh, detail, here, 20% when you looked at the expansion population actually had what was defined as a neurologic severe event. So that's encephalopathy in 8%, aphasia in 4%, headache 3%. So that is something that we will have to keep an eye on as trials move forward. Though typically, as, as, as was identified in the dose expansion, typically within the first couple of days of the infusion and resolved to grade one uh, or better upon discontinuation or with supportive care. These are all of the treatment-related uh, AEs. Again, there are terminology issues when you start to include all of them in theory. So importantly, no grade four or grade five AEs. And when you add up the grade three, as I mentioned, it ends up being, again, roughly in that uh, 10 to 12% range. And again, the encephalopathy was the most common with uh, six patients or 8%. Here's some of the PK. Um, you know, it is dose proportional from 5 to 90 micrograms per meter squared per day. The clearance, as you can see, the terminal half-life in lymphoma is the same. It's about two hours. Um, so again, nothing that surprising here. Looking at, P, at PD, they were able to demonstrate profound B cell depletion as expected. Uh, interestingly, they did see some redistribution of T cells with some decreases immediately thereafter and then nadirs are occurring within 24 hours in a return over the first one to two weeks. And in some patients, they did see some T-cell expansion during weeks two to four. Clinical responses, again, this isn't gonna pro project. I just have you look at the bottom there. So looking at the various subtypes of lymphoma, uh, you get a sense there that there is activity in probably one of the toughest things we treat, DLBCL, with six responses in 11 patients. 
In mantle cell, again, a smaller number of patients, but five of seven responses, 70%. The Europeans are planning to take that forward in a separate phase two trial. There are phase two trials ongoing in DLBCL. 12 of 15 follicular patients responding, giving a response rate of 80%. So the drug is certainly active. Uh, here's a, a swimmer's plot looking at some duration of responses. Again, the green is complete remissions. Blue is partial responses, so there does appear to be some benefits, uh, even with some now reasonable duration uh, follow-up in some of these cases. Though again, the patients on the bottom are indolent lymphomas in large part, follicular lymphoma, and they appear to have uh, better durations of response. It's kinetically a slower disease, and there may be more opportunity for an immune active therapy to lead to response. So the summary of the phase one study then, um, it was looked at at a variety of doses. The MTD was established at 60 mics per meter squared per day. DLTs as expected were neurologic. An overall response rate of about 70% at the 60 microgram per meter squared uh, dose. Response is seen across multiple histologies. The AEs as mentioned I think are not uh, really that different than what we saw from the previous data. So the lessons here, I think, moving forward, you know, toxicity is certainly an issue. CRS may be a little less concerning uh, based on the data seen in the lymphoma setting now that they've understood how to manage it from a dosing standpoint. The CNS thing is still an issue. The delivery is still something that can be worked on because it isn't particularly convenient. And we, we need to really learn better if some of these toxicity issues can be mitigated with things like PPS or corticosteroids. Certainly this meets the bar in terms of efficacy and being able to take this forward for further development. And strategies with other companies are being looked at antibodies with different affinities and potentially mitigating toxicity by depleting B cells first using ant antibodies like uh, rituximab as an example, or trying to maybe modulate how you approach the peak dosing, so maybe different dosing schedules. And uh, we're gonna be involved in a couple of uh, early phase study with, uh, uh, with Roche compounds as well, uh, testing these theories in early phase development. So this is what you see then. You know, I think this is a very interesting time because with the bispecific, you could theoretically, again, engineer attaching this to any effector cell of your choice, a dendritic cell, an NK cell, an MSC, and targeting a, a T cell of your choice. And thus you may be able to target uh, both markers on uh, uh, tumor cells, or potentially you may be able to manipulate the microenvironment, and this is where I think it gets uh, quite interesting. So just to draw your attention to one thing that I think will be uh, something we'll be watching moving forward, so again, a, a company called Afimed has developed a bispecific called AFM13. This time the business end is with CD16 on the NK cell, so not the T cell, and CD30 is the target. Again, this is being developed predominantly in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, by attracting NK cells into that uh, milieu. And what they see so far, very, very early days, PRs in three of 13 patients, um, this was a study led by the German Hodgkin study group, stable disease in another eight of 13, with a favorable safety profile. So I think we're gonna see more uh, from this type of a strategy manipulating NK cells as well. So maybe a little outside of talking about bites specifically, but I think uh, a very interesting strategy. And so uh, to conclude, Bispecifics, I think, are a new therapy that uh, influence immune effect or tumor interactions. They don't appear to alter cell properties, and so I think that becomes very relevant in terms of contrasting this against some of the things that uh, Naoto and Mark were already talking about. The paradigm is well established in ALL now with clearer signs of efficacy. The toxicity is something I think that needs to be worked on to make these things more relevant and more broadly available in more common diseases. And I concluded with the idea that bispecifics are being developed that are gonna target multiple immune effectors in hematology and multiple uh, target tissues. So again, uh, these are uh, being moved forward in a variety of solid tumors in early phase studies as well. And uh, so with that, I'll thank you.